Okay, cool. So, um, so I'm Anna Grenfell. I'm the registered nurse for ME CFS Canterbury, um, and I work with people one on one to help them manage their ME CFS and access services. Um, so, ME CFS Canterbury um, is a charity for people with ME CFS and their Fano, and we predominantly work in the Canterbury area, but we do um, do some other work outside of the area as well. Um, today we have Francis Young um, is coming to talk to us about um, coping emotionally with living with a chronic illness. So thank you so much, Francis, for um, agreeing to attend. Um, this session is being recorded. Um, however, there will be a question and answer section towards the end that won't be recorded. So if you do have any questions, just wait till the end or um, you can pop them in the chat throughout the um, talk and I'll read them out at the end. Okay, cool. Thanks, Francis. So you're handing over. I am. <laughs> and I'm square I'm sharing my screen. Hello, Kia ora, everybody. And um welcome to um a moment in time to have a conversation to listen in and think about the sense of what we're coping with, with chronic illness. What is our coping about and what it means for us as individually and also what it means for our uh, family, relatives, our friends, our Fano. Because what's important is that we do get to have a voice around actually the sense of what we're having to cope with and um thank you for coping with me online first and foremost um i think it's we're all kind of getting used to perhaps um a lot of um very high grade youtubing and and i haven't got a production team behind me um, so there won't be lots of uh, bells and whistles to my PowerPoint presentation, but hopefully um, it will um, give you a few highlights of perhaps things that are going to allow you to feel like you can connect to what I've got to offer today. It's not fully um, the whole picture, I know that. I know that our illnesses are deeply, deeply personal. So take what you will and indeed leave whatever's behind is like i say it's very deeply personal the way that we as individuals um, are in the world and how we cope with any given situation particularly stressful um, situations that occur in our lives so as um, anna was kind enough to invite me with rose to talk to you my background you may well or read the brief is I've been a um, counsellor psychotherapist working since the early 90s, 1993, I came into a practice and been working with people with long-term illness since then and um, learnt a lot and I'm still learning. So I'm going to just take it from there that um, we'll continue on with my slides now. So I've used some of Banks's work because I think you can lay over and project onto his work wherever you might be at. And um, regardless of what the artist intended, it's meant to draw you in to sort of place your own um, thoughts over. And I couldn't um, put a C on but it says no future and the T, I put it over the another picture of the no future picture 
And it, it, no cure is something that we know with chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, um, there is no cure. But that doesn't mean to say there isn't treatment and support and insights and self-care and, and the way we treat ourselves. And that's what um, I'm going to share a little bit about some of my experiences of being a human, of being um, somebody that also manages a chronic illness, but also being um, a care and supporter and in this field of counselling that I work in. And I'm just delighted to say thank you as well, because you were invited to also give me some background to what your interests were from me talking to you today. And um, I read through the different um, themes and um, where your interest lies. And I think I might have something for all of you. If uh, Forgive me if I don't particularly uh, pinpoint everything that you're asking about but I've definitely got some tools I've definitely got some thoughts and themes and I just invite you to relax and, and listen and, and know that you can always come back to the recording so that that would be interesting because I too will come back to the recording uh, hoping to be able to have access to it as well and um, in changing the slide now I've told you a little bit about myself. So this um, picture now um, is a really around how the, the little person inside of us is always informing what we're doing today. So no matter how long you've had the illness, how old you are chronologically in the world, there's still, we're driven by the child in us. And this is for me a sense of, um, the child within us taking care of ourselves and uh, playing with things um, so that we can experiment and explore just like children do to find their way in the world. And so I invite you to think about maybe some of the themes if they're new to you or something you might've heard about and thought, well, no, I actually haven't explored that for myself, that you see that as something that a child plays with. So then it takes the pressure off um, outcomes that you actually find yourself in your exploration of yourself to come to a better understanding, to come to a, a more comfortable place with perhaps your feelings and emotions, which I'm going to talk about because as we know, it's very a stressful situation, um, ME, CFS. It's a lonely experience for many people. Um, often people feel extremely um, insecure in their connection and relationship with um, family, friends, and um, the people that they encounter for their care and assistance. So I think it's really important that you see that you can come back to that sense of curiosity, like a child would pick up a new toy and imagining what this little boy's thinking about as he's sort of floating this little doll that's dressed as a nurse in his imagination how he then perceives what's happening so I invite you to e e explore the themes in that way with curiosity like a child would so that you can research and experiment in your own way um, so our time together today I've told to you that we're going to talk about anger and frustration um, with your ME and your CFS illness and also reminding ourselves that fibromyalgia might be part of your symptom expression as well. So insights into your challenges with particularly the changes that come and the losses that eventuate and possibly the challenges that you have with medical professionals. But notice I've put in brackets some medical professionals because I think it's really important that we remember that actually many medical professionals um, have got better insights and this wealth and research and knowledge is growing all the time. And also that some health professionals also have ME and CFS. So that it's just some medical professional, but certainly um, 
there's a lot of frustration around that connection, particularly with um, medical people and this feeling that um, there's a void of empathy um, and a sense that there's a hopelessness of trying to ask for help. But like I say, there are treatments, there is better ways of being with ourselves, uh, dealing with chronic yeah. illness. So I've got your interests here and um, we haven't got time to check in now, but I thought that maybe if you had questions at the end, I'll be very careful to listen to those. So I'm going to take you into my first slide. And we know some of the myths and we know some of the facts that there's nothing really wrong with a person with ME and CFS, but we know that it's a challenging illness and it often brings about change in many areas of our lives, work, study, and um, with our relationships with friends, loss and um, of hobby and ability to do day-to-day -day activities due to our reduced energy. And there's many other symptoms, particularly around soreness and, and muscle ache, headaches, and the stress on our mental well-being. So also there's a myth that it's an illness that primarily affects white middle-aged women, affluent women, but we know that certainly um, whilst it does seem to affect more women, that actually socioeconomic groups, the only ones that were studied originally were uh, people who could afford to have access to private treatment. So the research and the media uh, reviewing the research back in the day has stuck sometimes with people and they just have this image um, that it's um, you know, not affecting wider groups of community. But we know that, you know, there is a high prevalence of ME and CFS amongst minorities and people in lower levels of education and occupational st status as well. So, you know, right across the broad myth that it's just being tired all the time. But we know that the profound relentless fatigue is a characteristic, but it's more than just being tired. Numerous symptoms produced by the illness affecting every system in the body. And we know that the stress that's created by those uh, muscle pains, disturbance of sleep and migraines, visual problems and a host of other things are profound. So the hallmark symptom is post-exertional malaise, PEM, which I'm sure everyone that's tuned in today will be very aware of. The um, exertion on our bodies, mental and physical, that can lead to that exacerbation of the symptoms and possibly um, a recurrence of a collapse of an earlier phase where um, you feel, you know, very much um, more compromised than before. Children don't get ME or CFS, but we know that they do. And it strikes boys and girls equally. So that's whereas adults and um, we know that women more than men are affected by it. Children tend to experience all of the symptoms with equal severity and the majority of children do recover, but some will remain ill for years. Another myth is that it's caused by stress, but I'll just take you to the footnote of that no medical scientific basis of stress or personality um, that microbes, microbes are not uh, personality specific so it's not to do with your your personality or the necessarily stress loads that you were experiencing before um, your illness it doesn't pick you out like that and I think people often get tied into feeling somehow that they've created the illness it's something that they uh, are really um, kind of always searching for answers coming back to blaming themselves the myth around it being difficult to diagnose, that tends to be around people um, who just have um, a base, lack of basic understanding and that the ME can't be treated. And as we know that like any illness, it can be treated and that it's important that we give consistent messages and, and help and support towards encouraging people to know that there's a there's a there's a well-being that's personal to you that will satisfy and support you whilst you're ill with a chronic illness. And it's the same for ME and CFS. 
So until the progress comes for a cure that we can, you know, manage our symptoms better and um, enjoy our lives better. So just if there's anybody here that's found no carers responding to a person with ME, CFS, I think also as people that are um, struggling with the illness, you can also um, tune into this because it's self-care as well as caring for someone else. It's, we're talking about a care model. So we're thinking about compassionately listening. So people need someone to just listen to what's happening. So like you might not be able to feel as a carer that you can do that much, but just listening is a very important connecting thing because we need to have our understandings around our fears. That's a very significant thing. So compassionate listening is so important, very grounding, very nurturing for somebody that's dealing with ME, CFS. We need to be able to accept and believe because the myths in society of those who've experienced ME and CFS, they can doubt their own interpretation of their experiences and self-blame is a very common impact. And it's really important that we believe what our loved ones are telling us. And it's also helpful to tell them that it's not their fault. So it's so important that they get that message. Respect their decisions. Once you make the offer to support and share, pathways, the way that somebody's dealing with their MS, you need to respect um, their decision of how they want to deal with their illness of ME and CFS. It's also their choice to change their mind or not take action. So being very, very careful not to sort of blame or say, oh, you know, but you said you were going to do this that you just have to take the pace of the person who's got the illness. So that then becomes empowering for them. Very important that we have that Tino Rangatiratatana, where the empowering person with the information supports the autonomy of the person with the ME and the CFS. And that's really important because we know that ME, CFS, often creates feelings of powerlessness and we want to give that sense of power back to our loved ones. So expressing your thoughts and feelings about your illness. This is central to why I've been invited today. So I think that it's really important that we um, know that it's a very real sense of isolation and the sense of feeling um, apart from the world and knowing that as human beings that we're very much needing to be in communication with the world and in contact that's part of who we are. We're a herd uh, group, just like animals. We need to be connecting and relating. And of course, with the debilitation and the levels of uh, soreness and um, energy and the depression that can come from isolation. It's incredibly difficult um, to be able to um, be involved with wider community, to be able to have the energy to always um, set up and make plans and being able to express your thoughts and feelings around that to the people that care for you and that are in your lives, your families, your partners, your children, your friends is so, so relevant to actually feeling safer and secure because one of the big things that drives um, a lot of energy depletion is our fears and our anger around our situations. And if you think about how society has particular ways of um, informing both men and women about how they express their emotions, then we find that the opportunity to share thoughts and feelings and um, to be extremely confident to do that, our skill set is as good as the one that we grew up with and the one that we then go on to develop in adulthood. 
So however we were taught to relate at home, however we saw our parents and the skills that they had are the skills of your grandparents or the skills of your grandparents' parents. So going back along in the lineage of the family and the environments that we um, experience, we bring this skill set to our relationships, whether it be in friendship, to sense of being in connection with ourselves, being in connection with our colleagues, being in connection with our partnerships, our children. And the good news is that we've always got an opportunity to keep growing and being inquiring about how we can express our thoughts and our feelings in a way that's uh, manageable, and also brings clarity to help us to relationally get our needs met through ourselves and through being able to ask to give and receive. And that tends to be a very big part of my work as a counsellor, is sitting with my clients and supporting clients to express their thoughts and their feelings and to allow them the space and the opportunity to go deeper so that they can become tuned and attuned to the importance of our emotional well-being. And often when we're isolated, we don't get that opportunity for expression. And that can mean a sense of feeling quite highly anxious because we've got feelings and we've got lots of thoughts and they were around that can be extremely exhausting. And we've already got an illness that's extremely depleting our energy. Feelings also, if we haven't got a, 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 a way of expressing our feelings and experiencing empathy from both ourselves and outwardly from the people that we share the feelings with so that we feel acknowledged and we feel there's a compassionate empathy, we also find that sometimes we might depress those feelings. And again, depression in itself takes a lot of energy out of us and we've already got depleted energy. So that's why I think it's really important that we consider how do we relate and how are we able to find tools to find new ways of expressing ourselves so that we're better understood because there's going to be nobody who's going to be able to second guess you. And one thing that I also um, do a lot of is supporting people to really learn how to help themselves feel safe in being the teacher of other people about themselves, because that is also a responsibility that sits um, without its frustrations, because sometimes it requires a new way of learning how to talk and how to frame um, situations about ourselves and our feelings. And that comes back to becoming more tolerant of our emotional, um, our, our emotional um, awareness of ourselves and what's actually going on. And our bodies are very good at letting us know about that. So we need to be able to sort of work with the ME and CFS, but also notice the wider field of ourselves so that we get to tune in more deeply because our feelings are associated with a toolkit. And the toolkit is a resonance of what we're needing for ourselves and how to get our needs met is how to learn to articulate that. So in relationships, whether it be with a partner or a friend, wife, husband, with our children, with our parents, we have a responsibility to find our own toolkit of how to express ourselves in a way that allows us to be heard and understood because we have to teach people about ourselves and then we have to be patient as well to learn about how our people that we're relating to how they are also experiencing, you know, themselves in their world and in relation to their relationship with us. And it's quite an art to do that and do that sensitively with compassion for yourself and the other person. But it's definitely a toolkit that can be learned. And that's something that um, you would get from going to see a counsellor 
um, and um, learning some of those skills. So impacts on the affected person. And some days it can feel like it's really pouring and it just feels like a day where everything has to be as still as possible. And it might be too loud, it might be too light, it might just be that you need to stay as close to the bed as possible or safe in your chair as possible. And so it's important that you're able to talk about these are the impacts on me and this is how it makes me feel when I know that my energy is so low that I'm you know, not able to anticipate making plans um, as, in the way that I'd like to. Perhaps you've received an invitation or you're wanting to um, you know, make something um, happen with um, meeting with somebody or getting um, a meeting with a professional. So being able to actually explain that simply, but also a self-acceptance and a compassion. So showing ourselves some mercy, actually really being really tuned in and being honest about the impacts on, on how our bodies are feeling today, how our, our mood is, but also taking some ownership of that, this is what's happening for me. And then when we're listening to somebody else, that you also understand that this is their frame of reference and that they also have their history and their understandings. And so that you're able to slow things right down to be able to really check out whether you're, you're being understood. And this is how I'm feeling and not you're making me feel, but you come back to I statements. And that's something that can be easily practiced with a bit of time and patience. So we look at common experiences, difficulty relaxing, irritability and anger, soreness of the body, lack of sleep, poor sleep, bad dreams, disturbing images of thoughts when we get deeply into um, projecting into the future and worrying about forward thinking. That can possibly bring up avoidance of important discussions within relationships because many people do feel somehow quite responsible of the impact that that might have on different relationships or the family situation. So that can change mood. There's often an accompanying very deep sadness that goes with that. And it's all understandable, just checking in on the time. So the frame of reference and seeing the world is quite different. You can imagine that you've following your dreams, but you've had to put a big canceled notice over how you thought your life might roll out. So it's noticing ourselves, helping establish safety, listening to ourselves is the key, being in touch with our physical awareness. And these are probably self-care skills that you already have, taking care of yourself, noticing what your energy is. And when you're having a better day, that you um, have a pacing that goes with that so that you um, can continue rather than exhausting on the bit of energy that you're feeling, that you continue to just take care and notice so that you can um, have better days as part of a pattern. And knowing that when life has big tolls, when we get shocking news, grief, other normal everyday regular experiences, that we're possibly going to be more sensitive and, and, and knocked further than perhaps if you didn't have your chronic fatigue and ME. And that's really important to remember. So I would like to invite you to do a relaxation exercise with me because one of the things that we know is that the actual stress on chronic illness exacerbates symptoms. And so learning relaxation, learning meditation, which is a very simple thing. It's about coming back to the breath. It doesn't require fancy clothing. It doesn't require having to get a yoga mat. It doesn't require having to be at a purpose-built building. It's great if that's something that you can do, but it's something that you can do even on the, the hardest days is finding a way back to your breath to calm the mind to relax your muscles 
So I've got a little meditation that I was going to read out. And I was going to give you a little bit of time just to start by finding a comfortable position. Because we know anxiety and depression and irritability all decrease with regular sessions of meditation. It's a fact. It's, it's well researched. Studies have shown that meditation bolsters the immune system. And this helps fight off symptoms of ME and chronic fatigue. So this is a very short body and breath meditation. And I hope that you'll settle into just going with my simple instructions. So either finding yourself sitting as you are or lying as you are. I want you to, if you're sitting, just allow your feet to be flat on the floor with your legs uncrossed and your spine straight so that your posture supports your intention to be awake and aware. In this way, the posture is dignified but comfortable, not stiff or tensed up. And if you're lying down, allow your legs to be uncrossed with your feet falling away from each other and your arms lying alongside straight away from your body. Now, close your eyes if that feels comfortable, or lower your gaze and bring your awareness to the sensations where the body is in contact with whatever you are sitting or lying on. Spend a few minutes exploring these sensations. At a certain point, gather your attention and move it to focus on your feet so that the spotlight of attention takes in the toes, the soles of the feet, the heels, the top of the feet and the ankles. Attend to any and all of the physical sensations you can be aware of in your feet and ankles moment by moment. Notice how sensations arise and dissolve in awareness. If there are no sensations, simply register a blank. This is perfectly fine. We're not trying to make sensations happen. We're simply registering what is already here when we attend. Now expand your attention and take in the lower legs, the knees, the rest of your legs. Hold both legs center stage in awareness. Notice whatever physical sensations there may be here in the legs. Expand your attention up the body to the pelvis and hips, the lower back, and the lower abdomen. Move up the pulse, the torso to include the chest and the back, right up to the shoulders, noticing all the physical sensations in the torso. Expand your attention again to include the left arm, then the right arm, then the neck and the face and head until you are holding the whole body in awareness. See if it is possible to allow the whole body and its sensations to be just as they are. There's no need to try to control anything. As best you can, allow sensations to be just as you find them. At a certain point, bring your awareness to the centre of the body. 
to the sensations in the abdomen as the breath moves in and out of the body. Become fully aware of the changing patterns of physical sensations in this region of the body. If you like, you can place your hands here for a few breaths and feel the abdomen rising and falling. There may be mild sensations of stretching as the abdomen gently rises with each in-breath and there may be different sensations as the abdomen falls with each out-breath. For the full duration of each in-breath and the full duration of each out-breath, be fully alive to the sensations of breathing. There is no need to control or try to control the breath in any way at all. Simply let the, breath, the breath breathe itself. Focus on the physical sensations, breath by breath, moment by moment. And sooner or later, you'll probably find that the mind wanders away from the breath to the thinking, to the wondering, maybe planning, maybe remembering or daydreaming. When this happens and you notice that your attention is no longer on the breath, there's no need to judge yourself or criticize yourself in any way. No need to rush back to the breath. Instead, take your time, allow yourself to register where the mind has wandered to. And then when you're ready, very gently, but firmly bring your attention back to the breath. Such mind wandering will happen over and over again. Each time, remember that the aim is simply to notice where the mind has been and then gently escort your attention back to the breath. Seeing the mind wandering as a chance to cultivate patience and compassion. As you bring the attention back, remind yourself that noticing that the mind has gone and bringing it back again and again and again and again is the meditation. This is the practice coming back to the breath. And now I just invite you to continue to practice this by yourself. Maybe at another point after we finished our sharing today. We, I would suggest that you try to do a little meditation like this at least twice a day for a week to see the difference that you can bring into your own experience. So thank you for trusting me with that. Now that you've had a little moment to just come back into your body, just going to raise the themes of loss and despair and sadness and anger and confusion that are all raised in our experiences of living with chronic illness. And we know that when we're lost in our thoughts around these particular energies of emotion, that it can be, as I said, dialed up into a sense of feeling very out of control and quite anxious, or we can feel so overwhelmed by these feelings that it just feels so heavy that we push them right down. And we have to use a lot of energy to push the feelings down. And often people have expressed when they've had conversations with me and I've had my own conversations therapeutically as well is that it feels really heavy when we're trying to force a pressure on top of these emotions and we're remembering that we're already limited and depleted in our energy and yet we use these last bits of our energy to push down the sense of 
loss and despair and sadness and anger and confusion. As the opposite end or in equal parts, we can move between feeling very flat and then feeling highly anxious. And again, if you imagine somebody on stage that does plate spinning and how they have to move around to keep the plate spinning, that equally takes a lot of energy. And we know that we've already got limited amounts of energy. So somewhere in the middle is just that sense of where we came when we practice our meditation of just being with what is, just noticing our thoughts, coming back to our breath accepting that these are our thoughts, accepting that these are our feelings and being able to allow ourselves to just notice and inquiring in a curiosity. What is this trying to tell me? What is this emotion saying about what I now need and how we learn then to express that need to get our needs met? And that's about a deeper communication with ourselves and with other people. With anger especially, I think we've got a lot of negativity around how in community and societally we're not allowed to express our anger. We're not shown how to express our anger in a particularly functional way. But if we understand that anger is a deeply rich emotion that tells us that we're experiencing fear, we're under stress, and that we're wanting something to be different, that we could use the anger to be illuminating if we study what the anger is around, rather than sending it back into ourselves and maybe punishing ourselves. And that will lead to also having much more clarity around our other emotions, around the genuineness of the loss that we experience and some of the despair of the sadness of the difficulties of not perhaps being able to anticipate how the future is. But one of the deeper messages from meditation and breath work is just being in the moment of just being. And that's quite a difficult concept to get your head around when you first introduce the thought, well, just be, it is how it is. This illness is how it is today, moment to moment, and coming to learn how to feel that you can embrace an understanding and a connection to your humanness of how you deal with that. So setting up our own self-care, talking to a trusted non-judgmental person, asking for time, researching self-care, things that work for you, and experimenting and exploring that, making graded plans, finding simple approaches, thinking about one small change at a time, simply as being curious, simply of knowing that change can come from becoming more present, not expending your energy with the depression and the heaviness, learning tools that will help you explore and express yourselves. I always talk about eating well and nourishment as a therapy so important to be able to eat simple nourishing whole foods it has a profound effect on our bodies and why wouldn't it so i'm looking at a holistic way of self-care for our emotional well-being our physical well-being spiritually connected with our sense of ourselves and in connection with our environment and and the people that we love and that we share our lives with talking to ourselves first compassionately and being accountable so that we're aware of when we're making choices that we're we genuinely are choosing, that we're not making statements internally to ourselves that I have to do it like this, that we notice that there are choices, even when we feel like the defined choices feel so narrow, there still are choices of how we might be able to take some action choose to be with our thoughts, choose to be with our bodies, choose to be with what we choose to eat and how we choose to talk to ourselves. These things we have power over. Mindfulness, finding peace, which we've done a little bit of today. Maybe drawing and painting or writing is another way of expressing ourselves. We're not talking about being 
you know, uh, somebody um, who has got a, a big following and a long list of um, paintings to make, to sell. We're just talking about expressing ourselves, simply making marks on a page, noticing what comes out of picking up colors and crayons, being able to make shapes and patterns, even using um, coloring in books and noticing using color and using expression or just using free expression. If you're finding that difficult, recording your own voice memos, when you have a thought and you think, gosh, that's an inspired thought or that's a thing that's troubling me, I'm going to make a note of that. So you put that on your phone so that you have it as a keepsake and you can come back to it. And then you can do, when you have some energy, look for your research, look for your communication tools. I know that sometimes we feel as weak as kittens, but you know, even kittens stretch. So being able to make some choices around how we move, even on the bed, to make sure that we keep our muscles um, attending to um, our stretches and attending to our breath so that um, we bring the juices through into our joints as well. And maybe supportive counselling, that can be from peer counselling, might be going to see a practitioner, it might be uh, looking to get accommodation and making relationship changes. So, you know, maybe talking about um, talking to your partner or your family communication, that's all possible if you wanted to go and see a therapist or maybe talking to somebody in your peer group who's already done that might have some skills and insights to help you about how they've perhaps talked about more difficult things. Gosh, the time's romping on. So we know a sensitive approach is important. We mustn't run all over ourselves. Otherwise, we just get overwhelmed. Self-care, the Tharatapa Pharma, spiritually, self-physical, our family, our land, our roots, and our social connections, and our mental, emotional well-being. There's national helplines. I know you're already connected to MECFS. And we can make all the difference by the way that we handle ourselves. Otherwise, we might just feel that we're kind of left hanging. Questions and answers. I haven't left a lot of time, but I'm... I